thanks. It's really a pleasure being here. Um, this is basically the only slide I will be showing. So if the new institute wants to show off the ease at which you can open and close these curtains, be my guest. Natural light would be very welcome for many in the room, I think. So I, I've prepared a text and um, because I, I, I have a lot to say, I think, and, uh, and I, I wanted to be quite dense about it. It's the first time that I tried this format, so be kind with me. Um, it's divided in five chapters. Chapter one, Rotor at the Foire du Midi. Every summer, for a total of seven weeks, part of the central ring road in Brussels transforms in an improvised amusement park. All kinds of special attractions uh, for all kinds of audiences are being mounted. There is a roller coaster, a big wheel, improvised casinos with coin pushers, slots, bumper cars, and much more. Each attraction comes with its own soundtrack of pumpy house music. Entrance to the Foire du Midi is free, and a lot of kids are just hanging around to enjoy the atmosphere. It's only when you want to go on one of the rides that you are required to pay. One particular setup deserves our, our attention. It consists of two cylinders placed on top of each other. The largest one on top is marked with big bold letters R-O-T-O-R. -O -O and because I work at a company that shares the same name, um, I obviously noticed this setup. In fact, every summer I get at least a couple messages from people asking me if I know about the other rotor. Rotor, the one at Foire du Midi, is, as I said, made of two cylinders. The biggest one uh, on top, uh, uh, more or less nine, meter, nine meters in di diameter. Paying customers can enter in the bottom one. When enough people have entered, the cylinder starts spinning. That creates a centrifugal force which press the passengers in the outer shell of the, of the volume. A different ticket can be bought to go up the stairs in the second cylinder um, where uh, the fun comes from watching the passengers below as their bodies try to cope with the strange experience. When the below chamber reaches cruising speed, the centrifugal forces become strong enough for them to supersede normal gravity. It is possible, in theory, to stand on your legs on the outer partition. Formally, this is of course forbidden, Imagine just the liability issues. But the viewing compartment would not have many satisfied customers if there weren't at least a few people trying. Standing up is quite hard to do. It requires more practice than what most people are willing to spend in fees on the ride. After a few minutes, the spinning slows down and gravity becomes again the principal force to be reckoned with. The slowing down happens gradually, so as to let all the passengers slowly adapt to the changing condition. At the exit, there is a last attempt at monetizing the experience. Pictures of each passenger are offered for sale. Chapter 2. The founding of Rotor. Picture a tall building, yet to be built. It will be clad from the top to the bottom with beautiful white marble. With a single instruction, its architects create two distinct situations, a hole and a building. The direct result of a car carefully orchestrated process of material accumulation will be a tower. On the other hand, the indirect result of the, is, a, is a product of subtraction. Somewhere in the world, a big white hole has been created to provide the marble. It is quite remarkable that only one of those consequences is considered to be within the scope of architecture. The opinion of architects, landscape architects or designers is not asked uh, on the appropriate shape uh, made in the quarry or even if the whole should be made. In fact, great efforts are being made to sufficiently abstract the marble so that it can be treated as merely a digital object, a texture that can change at the push of a few buttons. There's big cranes shopping blocks of stone from the landscape, trucks carrying them down the mountain, sawing stations that cut the block in slabs, more trucking, transport overseas, container terminals, and so on. All of that is implicit in the architectural decision at, uh, for the cladding, but it remains unaddressed. As an anecdote, I once had the chance to visit the sample library uh, at the headquarters of SOM in Chicago. In a special uh, room, there were hundreds of A4 samples of nicely polished uh, stone. 
Some of the slabs uh, were marked with a red dot. When I inquired, I was told that this was a way to mark all of the marbles that were exhausted and no longer available for SOM projects. 15 years ago, I co-founded the Rotary with Tristan and Lionel de Vlieger to acquire a more in-depth understanding of how material economies operate. And those interested in materials, let's say the matters that have been transformed in some kind of way by humans, well, they inescapably will be confronted with the question of waste. The vast majority of all existing materials that were produced by humans are either already waste or very fast on their way to becoming waste. They lie or are about to be transported to landfills, incinerators or other waste treatment facilities. The marbles that were so cleverly marked with a red dot by the SOM librarian, they have not disappeared. They were not taken out of this planet by an Asian invasion. They are still there. Part of them have served for a few decades and then they have been crushed and discarded. In fact, close to a third of the extracted volume of any given natural stone is wasted at the quarry itself in the form of offcuts. As designers or researchers, if you want, we were interested in the potential of these vast waste streams. We saw them as an overlooked and important topic, specifically so in the wake of the current uh, ecotope crisis. Chapter three, the founding of Rotor Deconstruction. Rotor had taken a swift start and was by now the principal job uh, for Tristan, Lionel and myself. There was also a handful of other collaborators. We had structured as a non-profit and uh, formed a growing collective of similarly minded individuals. A series of uh, lucky events had contributed to the international notoriety of our organization. We had made a few temporary architectural interventions in Brussels and uh, that gave us uh, enough credit to obtain the commission for the Belgian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale where uh, we received the attention of the international press and also specifically the attention of Rem Kolhas. We received uh, a commission for the curation of a retrospective on the work of OMA at the Barbican. We exhibited in, uh, at Fondazione Prada during Salone del Mobile. We won a competition for a new fashion and design center in the center of Brussels together with uh, V+. Our phone was ringing and we had no shortage of clients. Material and the qualification as waste was still the topic we cared most about. But there is a limit to the amount of quarries we can visit and research we can do. We felt that there was a need to acquire a more hands-on knowledge and in the moment of strategic underestimation, we founded a new company named Rotor Deconstruction. Rotor Deconstruction is concerned with the end of use of buildings. We try to propose alternative material management strategies, ways for material not to become waste products, but remain usable in their current form. In the same way that you do not throw away your jacket every time it stops raining, perhaps building materials too can be stored after their first use, cleaned, made ready for a second use, and so on. Can reuse of building materials be a large-scale strategy that offers a way out of the dichotomy uh, between preservation and demolition? It would allow for a dynamic and constant remodeling of our built environment, there would be no need to be conservative to conserve. In those first days, our strategy was to do it all. We hunted for buildings that were about to be demolished. We negotiated with the owners. We offered free deconstruction service in exchange for the materials. The whole operation was then financed by the sale of the obtained materials. They were treated in our workshop to be fit for use first. In some cases, we got involved in the new design and even in the reinstallation of the materials. We were what was in the industry referred to as vertically integrated. Very quickly, we benefited from a healthy attention from the local architecture scene for our new initiative. People were buying our salvaged materials, even if they were sometimes slightly more expensive or slightly more burdensome to work with. We wanted to get better and we set ourselves an ambitious goal. Salvaged materials uh, should be as easy to use as their equivalent new products. 
to accomplish this, we set up dedicated workshops for specific materials. Lighting fixtures, for instance, were recabled, tested, sometimes even refitted to allow for the use of energy efficient light bulbs. We built a denailing station for wooden floorboards. We invested heavily in the setup of a series of acid baths specifically conceived to remove mortar from tiles. The acid removes the mortar, it dissolves it, but leaves the tile intact. The installation has a capacity of a few thousand square meters per year. It is modular and can, still, uh, and can easily be expanded. Then came a moment of crisis. Even though Rotor DC had been set up with a relatively small starting capital, and even if we received very little state funding, mostly R&D, um, as many startups uh, would receive, our company was growing and we were managing to run break even until we no longer were. And we realized too late that the sort of materials our business model relied on uh, were much more exceptional than we had assumed. Specifically, one of the first buildings we had salvaged a large uh, amount of materials in, in retrospect, we understood that it would probably never, uh, sorry, that we would probably uh, never again be offered an equally attractive proposal. Imagine having a crew taking down a thousand euro doorknobs for a few days in a row. Just four screws to be unfastened, a thousand euros of merchandise. Four more screws were already at 2,000 euros. And then there was granite, brass cladding, large amounts of wenge wood, designer furniture, and so on. We extracted hundreds of thousands uh, of euros in kind from that building. And so we did not realize in time that most of the other stuff that we had been doing, offering free deconstruction services, for instance, was dramatically losing us money. When all you need to do to make ends meet at the end of the month is to sell a few doorknobs now and again, then that is what you do until there are no doorknobs left. At this point, maybe I'm going off text to just tell you, like, I know the theme of this presentation is uh, um, uh, precarity. I'm not announcing bankruptcy, uh, uh, <laughs> so, so don't be afraid of, uh, about that. Um, chapter four, the concrete paver index. Picture a standard concrete paver. It is simple to understand this material. A solid block of concrete, nine centimeters by nine centimeters, about 30 centimeters wide. It is produced in great quantities in an industrial press and it is used for uh, paving streets. Pavers require no mortar uh, for installations. They are simply stacked next to each other. In theory, their construction is thus quite easy. Break away the first row and uh, all the other pavers can simply be picked up by hand. Because this, this deconstruction requires few skills and because the paver is such a widespread we can say generic material, I think it lends itself to become part of an international index that I'm proposing. The ambition of this index is to offer a score on how easy it is to organize reuse of building materials in a specific economy. It consists of a single number for each tested area that is obtained in the following way. It is the proportion of the cost price of a worker stacking reused pavers on pallets for one day as compared to the local market value of the said uh, obtained uh, pavers. My best estimate for Belgium would be a proportion around two or three. Sorry, around one over two or three. Meaning that it is three times more expensive to simply move a paver a couple of meters by hand than it is to have new pavers delivered. There, uh, are of course exceptions, but in Europe, North America, and many other regions, uh, uh, this is uh, absolutely the case. We can apply the same logic also the other way around. If we assume that all business need to run at least break even, then we can test the reusability score of materials according to the same criteria. A material is then to be considered reusable only if the cost of dismantling, handling, processing, and so on multiplied with a small factor of risk, if that number is lower than the market value of the obtained material. In other words, and maybe shorter, reuse is feasible if it's cheaper than the new equivalent. People are not willing to pay more for a second-hand product. Now, here's the catch. 
this equation is true for a very, very small group of materials. Only the most exquisite, exquisite materials, and they have to come in great quantities and in perfect condition, can co hope to compete with these new prices. Reuse in the Belgian context can provide either of both options. We can provide expensive, second-hand cheap materials, or we can uh, provide slightly cheaper, second-hand expensive materials. Take, for instance, a wooden floor. Um, it is the same work, the same cost to demount an oak floor as it is to demount a, a pine floor. The basic cost remains, and so uh, the uh, uh, value of the obtained material is going to be the determining uh, factor. The oak might be profitable to demount, the pine floor certainly is not. My job at Rotor DC is to apply this criterion hundreds of times a week. I visit demolition sites where I scan to find those materials that beat the equation. I read demolition assessments on a daily basis, going through lists and lists of materials contained in a building. I receive dozens of proposals for material per email per day. In many cases, my judgment on these materials is the final one. Is it a keeper or is it a goner? My judgment is the last chance for these materials not to end up as waste. And I experienced this as a very painful, ex uh, sorry, I experienced this as a very painful experience. I have to change that sentence. <laughs> I condemn uh, kitchens that are by far more luxurious and in better conditions than the kitchen in my own house. Because kitchens do not scale. Kitchens are full of surprises. The risk factor is just too big, the margins are too thin, whether that is a bulltop or not. I feel like a Roman emperor deciding over life and death of gladiators in an arena, except that for practical reasons, I'm forced to show thumbs down to almost all of the fighters. Those that fought brave and lost, they die. Those that fought brave and won, they die too. Rotor, by the end of this year, will apply around 18 full-time equivalents. As I said, we're not about to go bankrupt. However, from a, a sort of a principal point of view, from, a, from a, a philosophical point of view, there is really a limit at what our project can do, and we are questioning uh, what the implications of that are. Chapter five, when gravity will kick in. It is quite obvious that the economy we are operating has gone crazy. At no point in history of mankind have we seen anything like this. My concern here is not only the tremendous quantity of materials we barely use and waste. We are experiencing and we are part of an ecocide. And this crisis is the direct result of how the global economy is made up. And I find it important to say, and say it again and again, that the economy is human-made. It is not natural law. It is not gravity. It can change. Our current economy, for me, it compares to the centrifugal force in that other water, the amusement park ride. First, we need to acknowledge, it is a real force. Whoever is in the chamber, the spinning chamber, cannot escape this force. In this chamber, it does not matter whether it is human-made or, or not. You cannot relativize it. You cannot say, I do not believe in this supposedly human-made centrifugal force, and therefore I am not subject to it. The economy does not require your consent to be real. As long as the chamber is spinning, there is very little that one can do to prepare for a stopping event. Some might argue, after a few years in that drum, that we need to do that, anticipate the stopping of the spinning. We should resist the centrifugal force, they might say. Ignore it. Tell our students how current conditions are historically an anomaly, and only a few years ago the spinning started. There, is a, there was a time before the spinning started. And in such a context, stuck in a spinning drum that might or might not stop spinning with no memory of gravity, the real crazy idea is this one, to try and walk on the floor. <laughs>